All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So, uh, number one, thank you very much for uh, patiently waiting for me to come back after my FLCCC meeting. I would give you a report next week. Today we have with us Sean Barkovich once more. Uh, as you have seen from his previous interviews, he is something that... Um, someone that our healthcare authorities would declare as a rare case of vaccine injury. He has been, of course, I don't say that, but um, putting that context in front of us, that that is how authorities um, declare this situation. And then here is your experience of a person. Uh, we have interviewed and discussed Sean's symptoms and management before. And it I thought and Sean was thinking that this is important that we follow up to see what other therapies Sean has tried, what has worked, what has not worked. So with this uh, context, Sean, welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bean. It's good. It's somewhat good to be back. It's always a mixed, a mixed yeah. bag. I wish I was here for other reasons. Agreed. Agreed. And so a uh, couple of house uh, administrative things. Number one, when I am looking here, this is where Sean is. So don't, I'm not ignoring you on the camera. I'm just looking at Sean here. That's one. Secondly, the the comments, if you have any question in the comments, put QQQ with that. And the comments are over here. So when I'm looking away, I'm actually scanning your comments to see if there is any comment or question that I can put to Sean. And if I'm looking here, this is where Sean's presentation or Sean's uh, websites will be shown. And the important disclaimer is none of this all is a medical advice, uh, neither from Sean and nor from me. That is one. Secondly, Sean, since he has been vaccine injured, he has started an organization to help other vaccine injured folks. And I would let Sean explain how they are helping for their management. So I have no commercial interest at all. I have no commissions, no no cuts, nothing. It is actually a charitable organization and Sean and his team are actually trying to help others as well. I would have hoped this is something that our healthcare authorities would do. So with this disclaimer, Sean, welcome. Thank you. So Sean, just for the context for the new viewers who may see this for the first time, tell us a little bit about yourself and what is your situation and also what is your current situation? Right. So, um, so I'm a research nurse practitioner by background, and I was also injured by the Pfizer vaccine. I had a reaction after the first dose that was somewhat milder, that, can, that in a brief summary consisted of paresthesias along my right arm, uh, neck, face, eye, ear, and into my uh, axilla and upper back. That subsided. I got a second dose on January 19th of 2021, about three weeks later, and I had it in my left arm. And within three to four days, I started with the reaction again on my right arm. I woke up on the fourth day with tinnitus in my right ear. Uh, that all just downward spiraled, as you remember, into dysautonomic uh symptoms of tachycardia, wild swings in blood pressure, severe insomnia, adrenal dumps. Um, and then it progressed into full body neuropathies uh, with burning, stinging, stabbing everywhere. Um, so that's the summary. I feel like we've been on this journey together since the beginning when I first came on. And uh, it's unfortunate that it's still ongoing and I'm back again. And, and Sean, I want to thank you in advance for being out there, for presenting your case. Your case has been in the BMJ. Now your case is here in the Wiley Library as well. You have gone and spoken with the uh, lawmakers as well. So this is uh, a lot of effort on your end when you are actually also disabled by the vaccine injury. Right. So right. I thank you from myself and from all the cool beans in advance for your effort while you're in this situation. I'm going to very quickly show to the audience. So this is drbean.com, but this is what is important. This is the latest new development from Sean's side. So Sean, would you like to tell us what this is? Yes. Yeah, so as you know, as part of my uh, progression in my disease, I, I've been 
not only an advocate for the injured, um, but also an advocate for myself as I navigate uh, the healthcare system. And uh, so as every, as all of us that are injured have found out along the way, it's not easy to access care, competent care in the medical system and get uh, a diagnosis and actually get any treatment. But uh, as part of my journey and pushing the system, I presented my case to my neurologist. I showed him some of the labs that I had run that were positive, some of the autoantibodies uh, from testing in Germ that I had done in Germany. And then I just uh, showed him all the documentation of my symptoms, uh, you know, the, the cardiac instability with the positional tachycardia. I talked about my small fiber. So uh, we started a course, of, if you remember, of IVIG uh, back in no October. Um, but by November and December, I was having a lot of side effects from it. I had mild hemolysis. I had a cephalic vein clot. Um, so it wasn't, <laughs> my body wasn't liking it very much, but it was helping me. Um, I would I would have flares of my symptoms and then it things would regress. And that was a pattern um, through, from October through December of 2021. But when I started to continue to have uh, side effects, uh, including a bout of aseptic meningitis, they were like, let's pause the IVIG. Um, let's consider a trial of plasma exchange. So in order to do plasma phoresis or plasma exchange in the United States, you're actually admitted to the hospital. Uh, for the procedure, they insert a, ce a central line uh, into your uh, subclavian or jugular vein area, and uh, they do five exchanges over 12 days and uh, replace you with human albumin. So I underwent that in March of 2021. And at the end of that, I was neuropathy free, I could say a lot like marked improvement. So the IVIG kind of carried me part of the way and then I feel like plasma exchange took me over the final hump and uh, when I was discharged I I had a decrease in my volume of tinnitus it wasn't a hundred percent gone but it was it went from a suicidal 10 to a more livable five got it thank you very much and so this is that case that has been now accepted so this is wiley online library and the date here is 7 august 2022 and i wanted to just very quickly show this to the audience here it says here this article has been accepted for publication and undergone full peer review but has not been th through the copy editing typesetting pagination and proofreading process which may lead to difference between this version and the version of the record the point i'm making is um I see many times that there are comments and there are reports of saying that we are presenting something that may not be common. Here is a case that is accepted and published. And it is important for all of us to see these cases as well, to understand that there are people out there who are in this situation. Okay, back to you, Sean. So this is one case that is here. Any other comment about the case before I... Yeah, so I, I wanted to say that, I just wanted to follow what you were saying. I think this is really, I can't emphasize enough the impact that this has for uh, the injured community. One, it validates us. It validates this type of reaction of small fiber, tinnitus, autonomic dysfunction. Um, it, you know, it, it, can, it confirms solidly that this exists and this is real. So I think this is groundbreaking for us. Um, it was, it took a tremendous effort to, to arrive to this moment, but I feel like it is, it is a poignant moment uh, for all of the injured because it gives some validation to us. It also helps to substantiate a pathway to some trials of treatments for people. 
Got it. Thank you very much. And Sean, uh, I know that you are going to touch about this particular topic, but I want to, in the um, spirit of providing as much assistance or help or guidance as possible, Michael Sanchez says, there is a woman named Veronica Smith who has started that sh- who has stated that she's doing chemo for this type of neuro reaction. I never considered that chemo could help any thoughts. I believe you have undergone or are undergoing chemo as well at this time. Do you want to touch upon your current state and what m- therapies are going sure. on? Sure. I think it's important because I think it's a segue to where am I now, right? So we did this case study. It shows promise, but I think there's, a, there's important things for thing for the viewers to know, right? One is this is my case and this is what worked for me. And I always caution everybody out there that um, a lot of the injured, we, we look alike, uh, we have a lot of similarities, but I don't, I don't necessarily think the research is showing that we're all the same. So what works for me might not work for someone else. Um, having said that, I think, in my case, it, it showed some resolution, but it turned out by this May of uh, 2022 that uh, it wasn't it wasn't a sustained uh, response. So I did relapse around mid May. It started with some cardiac instability, some pot, some pots, uh, positional tachycardia, and then I uh, I had myalgias pretty severe in my shoulders, which I thought was unusual. I couldn't lift my arms above my head. And that was a new symptom for me, in fact. Uh, And then I started to get burning in my muscles of my legs and arms. And then muscle twitching came back with a vengeance and uh, some of the prickling sensation. So I reached out to my neurology team and I said, hey, um, everything's collapsing. uh, And it's pretty, it's, it's, a downward spiral. So he's like, why don't we try to re, you know, retrial the plasma plasma exchange? Cause it does only have a short window, right. Of, uh, of, a, of response in most cases, usually it's something you have to repeat. So what I, uh, unless you add in uh, immune modulators or some chemotherapeutic type drugs, So I reached out to my immunologist and I told him also that I was on a downward spiral and the immunologist and the neurologist got together and they said, why don't we start him on as a theoprene? So I uh, started that when I went into the hospital uh, at 50 milligrams and then over the next several weeks increased it to 100 milligrams. And there the thinking is that if this is an antibody mediated uh, disease, by adding in that, you're going to suppress uh, the production of the antibodies as you remove them. And uh, so chemo is still going on. It has not really helped a lot, correct? Uh, I think it's still what they say it's still too soon to tell. I think most people see um, a response at, towards the 12th week. Um, I have noticed uh, after the plasma, the second round of plasma exchange, it wasn't, while it wasn't as profound a response, I still had some response. Like I had improvement in the muscle burning, the twitching came down a bit, the fatigue improved, the brain fog improved, the tinnitus improved, but it wasn't a full resolution. Got it. And then you um, started developing the symptoms. Uh, are you now going through the plasma phoresis or IVIG or both? What so is- we started, I stayed on the azathioprine or Imuran as the, the brand is called. And then I uh, waited till I got up uh, to a level that's consistent with my weight. And I reached back out to my neurology team and I asked them about a trial of re, uh, retrying IVIG. They were amenable to that. And we looked for a protocol that would be kinder and gentler to my body. So we're following a uh, uh, what's called an MCAS protocol or a mast cell activation protocol. 
And that basically means we're just giving lower doses more uh, on a more frequent basis, adding in IV hydration and some IV steroids to preempt uh, some side effects. And I had my first round last Friday and I'm happy to say everything went smoothly. I didn't have any reactions. So I was relieved about that. Got it. And and the, the reason is uh, for the audience here, sometimes IVIG can cause flare-up because these are at the end of the day, these are antibodies. And when they go in our body, our body can then react to them and, these antibodies can actually trigger biological functions, which is their job. And ideally, they should pick up the antigens or this uh, offending agent. But at the same time, they start the inflammatory processes too. And some, sometimes that becomes a problem. Um, so plasmapheresis, IVIG, chemo, these are the ongoing therapies. So I don't know if we will continue with the plasma exchange at this time. We're going to see if the combination of the uh, azathioprine and the IVIG will be enough to achieve a, a remission, if we want to say. Got it. Uh, a few things from my point of view as well, and I'm seeing them in the questions here. I have a question about, have you tried uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy or HBOT? Then there is a question about the intermittent fasting. So let me ask you one by one. So here is a question from GK. What about HBOT? Uh, I I haven't tried HBOT yet. I'm scheduled to try that in August. I wanted to try it sooner, but the schedule at the nearest facility was full. So it's on my radar. And I also like to do it when I try things, I like to do a phased approach so I know what's working. So I'm doing this for now, see what re what response I get. And then sometime in August, I plan to, to add H HBOT. Got it. Uh, another question, which was in my mind as well, have you tried intermittent fasting or autophagy or anything that can trigger this? Coffee. I haven't tried autophagy yet. I did do some intermittent fasting and I have made diet changes. So I do do a, a anti-inflammatory type diet, low histamine. Um, I try to eat everything in my meals fresh, no processed foods. Uh, and I do believe that that helps. Um, I, mean, I don't think it's it's a total win, but it, everything is additive, right? So if you can keep inflation, inflammation down, um, yeah, it makes all, sense. It, it's all a benefit. But I, I have, I plan to try. I would like to try more intermittent fasting, and but it's hard when you're on as a theoprene because it can be very. The side effects of this the stomach can be difficult if you don't eat. Yeah, and again, for the audience's benefit, when you are on chemo, chemo tends to kill cells that are dividing or that are being replaced. So as part of that, uh, some body tissue parts of our cells are just continuously replacing. So our skin cells are replacing, our GIT lining is replacing all the time. And then our blood cells, white blood cells or such cells are being replaced all the time so when there is chemo chemo would damage these uh, things and the result can be more infections or exposure to uh, easier exposure to infections git irritation because the lining is not stable and the skin problems or even hair falling and so on so i understand that there is a question from uh, susan woodruff so won't chemo dampen your immune system and i think that was a point of it all as well yeah, it, to suppress. Yeah. So, that's, the, that's the goal. Correct. So, Susan, if you think about it, somewhere some B cells and T cells are sitting that are just continuously producing antibodies and various ways to clear those antibodies or to stop these cells from producing those antibodies is what Sean has been trying. And so one extreme way to do that is to just give chemo and kill off all those cells to see maybe when the the bone marrow rebounces it will not have those cells anymore and that would give a relief is that 
how your doctors are approaching it when they thought about chemo. Yes, exactly. So we're going on that premise, right? But and we're going based off of some positive autoantibodies that might be associated, but I think to date no one can really say with certainty, right? There could be a lot of unknown antibodies that are causing this that uh, you know, but the but the treatment would still be the same. Got it. So today as you sit here and we are we have just asked you about the therapies what is your today's condition how are you doing so neuropathies are are down but they're there i have a lo- i have a lot of neuropathy so i have burning in my eyes now uh, i have sometimes prickling sensations in my in the back of my throat tingling in my tongue i will get little flea bite sensations all over my body they tend to be worse at night Uh, some burning i have a lot of nerve pulling sensations on the right side of my face uh, down my neck sometimes it feels like i can almost trace the nerves themselves Um, and then i still have the tinnitus uh, which is yeah so so when I was uh, having COVID, not vaccine injury, COVID, and I had these palpitations and shortness of breath, my night will become pretty difficult. And I'll not only be anxious about my situation, but I also would actually have a physical problem. So I will not go to sleep. How does this all... What Can you sleep okay? No. I haven't slept good in 19 months, almost 19 months now. So do you take sleep uh, helps? Or? I take a lot of, I have a whole cocktail regimen to around sleep to try to rest at night. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's brutal at times. The other issue is I also have in my right arm, it, it tires easily um, with use, with just minimal use. So sometimes I will use my phone and I have to put my phone down like every five few minutes to rest my arm. So that's like affects everything during the day. I can't type for long periods of time. I can't hold the phone for long periods of time. I can't cook or do everything. I'm kind of always dropping my arm because it will just easily fatigue. I'm so sorry to hear this. And once again, thank you very much for being with us to share these uh, situations and therapies. At the end of the day, uh, audience, uh, Cool Beans, my reasoning for having Sean is to bring to you what therapies may be possible, what are working. Everything can be different for others, but still just to see the overall package of what are the possibilities and then one question left which i wanted to ask and that would also help and that is the labs so what are your labs like and what labs are you getting done more regularly and what labs have been the most indicative of your current situation i think the ones that were most revealing were the autoantibodies i had tested in germany so the ace2 the the mass1 the alpha1 receptor antibody i think those are telling i think some of the autoantibodies in the uh, in the german testing have been uh, disputed in other literature but there's still a lot of thought around at least alpha-1 receptor antibody being consistently high in uh, people with POT syndromes. Um, then no one really can, uh, no one really understands the full mechanism be- behind the ACE2 MAS1 uh, uh, receptors and how what impact that has on someone. Uh, that's still all uh, under research. Um, I think other testing that I have done, uh, uh, I have had on okay, on various occasions elevated D-dimers. Um, I just did testing to check if, you know, following possible microclotting theory. So I had recently a blood viscosity test. I did a fibrin degradation test. Both were normal. Uh, I never thought I had 
that micro clotting was my issue. I think that might be another subset of people. Um, also, because I during plasma phoresis, you're, you're also so uh, anticoagulated, um, they remove almost all your fibrin from your body. And at various points, I was so low, they wanted to give me transfusions of cryoprecipitate to replace that. Um, but so, uh, and I was still having those symptoms, even with all that co anticoagulant on board. So, uh, so I don't believe that that was my, that is my issue. Um, but I do believe that might be an issue among some others. But uh, for the chemo drugs, uh, for the Imuran, we have to check, you know, liver function and uh, your CBC on a regular basis to make sure you're not suppressing too much. Got it. And this one is an interesting question here from John. Is anyone developing antibodies against the autoantibodies like anti-ACE2, for example? Do you have anti-ACE2 still present or they're gone? So what, what I did is a, my own research experiment for, the, for, for all of this is I had, I had paid for and sent my labs before uh, plasma exchange. I sent them immediately after. So before they were elevated, I had ACE2 elevation. And then after, everything was negative. The panel was completely negative. I retested two months later, right before I relapsed and everything was high. And some of it was even higher than the, the initial. Got it. And there's a question from Bobby Floor saying that, please inform uh, Sean about FLCCC. I believe Sean, you are actually very well aware of it. And the other thing is many of the long COVID and vaccine injury protocols, I have contributed to them by myself as well. And mm -hmm. Sean and I have been in touch for about a year now. So he's very well aware of those. Those protocols have helped, but have not brought you 100% right. to the other, right? right? And we have also, we, you know, not we, but I would say people within the organization, RAC19, we have gathered a lot of research from all of the, all of the injured through various surveys. And we have learned what all people have been trialing since all of this began and that cumulative knowledge we have been feeding to our partners in FLCC and um, the Patterson group. So uh, we share as much as we gather to also help them to, so that, you know, their, their a lot of their protocols also stem from information that we've We've got about it. Yes. And I wanted to share this as well with the cool beans that look at this. Uh, number one, there are many vaccine injured within my family. My wife got injured. My niece was injured. My best friend, he was Sean, just like you were saying that you could not raise your hands. I met him last Friday. I'm going to meet him tomorrow as well. We meet every Friday. And he said, Mubin, I cannot lift my hands above this level. It's just, too, he's still, he's my age. We are, we are friends. He's from Sweden originally. And he has to pick up his legs with his hands to pull them up, to cross them. And he's still in the same state. So now he's promised to look at the uh, injury protocols and start working on them. The point I'm making is one, I realize that this is a problem that is out there. And secondly, I want to thank you, Sean, for helping not only yourself, but in the process of that, helping so many other. I think there are millions of people that are in this situation. So thank you very much. For I, think it's a, I think it's a, one, I, I'm a medical professional, right? So I, for months, I didn't actually say anything. I, I kept quiet because I was afraid, right? I think we... I think many of the injured can identify with that. We, you, it's almost like if you are injured, you feel shame to talk about it in public. And at a certain point when I realized at least initially how many people develop the tinnitus part, I mean, we have over 4,500 members just in one group uh, online for support. I felt compelled as a nurse if I didn't speak up 
because I also felt like I could bring some credibility to this, right? Because I am a nurse, I am Im embedded in the medical profession. I'm pro science, I'm pro vaccine. I'm, you know, I believe in ethics and research and I think reactions are real and to deny them would be the real anti-science, right? You, you have to recognize them because you wanna make a better, safer product. For the people. So, so for that, I feel, you know, because a lot of people who are out there, they speak and they bring the more fringe comments or the more outlandish things that this, you know, is, you know, all the statements. And I feel like that doesn't help any of us, right? We that stepped really up. Changed this whole situation. When people yeah. create, they go too much on an extreme and just makes strange claims that actually causes a negative outcome for those who are actually injured and need to be helped because now the whole group is dismissed the right. actual injured and the claim makers everyone gets dismissed right because i believe if you stick to the science there's enough truth and fact in all of us to to show the evidence right you don't yeah. need to fabricate you don't need to dramatize here yeah. i am you know these are my symptoms this is real you yeah. cannot deny it and i also want to piggyback on this comment esther chandler says thank you for helping people dr bean the cdc who and fda let us all down this vaccine should have been a choice anyone taking it it was part of a live study so the important thing here is the healthcare authorities should have and now should acknowledge, recognize that this is right. happening and there is help that needs to be offered. And I repeat it every time. If they say it is rare, if they say it is really small number of people, then helping them becomes even easier. They do not need to deploy a lot of resources to help, help a smaller number. Mm -hmm. I do not believe there is a smaller number. But let's go with their narrative, then they should even be more av aware and available and helpful. And uh, with that, I have a question for you, Sean. How are you paying for this all? Is Are you being helped? Are you given a code to say, yes, vaccine injury, here, use this code, and then insurance would cover you? How are you helping yourself at this time? I am, I am paying it all either from insurance or from my own pocket. And I am on uh, disability, so my income is tanked since this. I make a third of what I made before. And uh, yeah, it's... I'm very sorry for this. If I think about it, I would get emotional because it's like I think about my career and what I'm losing. Yeah, so how many ways the emotional a toll on these vaccine injured patients. And I have one at my home and I've seen her going through the emotions as well. Look, one reason for emotional imbalance is the actual long COVID or vaccine injury causing brain tissue uh, functioning issues, which would cause mood imbalances. That's one. Secondly, patient, when I was having palpitations and would not be able to sleep with COVID, and I am, by the way, I'm vaccinated. So if somebody is going to raise their hand and say, why did you not get vaccinated? I'm vaccinated. And I had palpitations and I couldn't sleep. That was second physical effect of the injury. And I think it's because of spike. And this would be true for vaccine as well. And then third is the financial loss and the anxiety with that. The, the, the anxiety of, am I permanently damaged now? All of this together has to be carried on the shoulders of such patients. And then they have to go figure out their solutions as well. How cruel is that for a sophisticated and advanced society like ours? No, imagine the other injured who don't have the medical knowledge that I have, right? Like I have harnessed all of that to help myself. And that's why I feel an obligation. I have to share that because no one is doing anything. You know, yeah. it's you yep it's, so uh, yeah. yeah and then i was going to add on top of all of what you said is not only all of that but the ptsd involved i think all of us have 
the mental component, right? We are not only injured and we have this illness, we have PTSD from the event, uh, from what we hear on TV. And then, you know, that, that just adds another dimension to all of this, right? As you're fighting your way for help. You're Absolutely. And uh, I would add one more, and that is people's cruelty in response. There are some who become very happy to say, you know what? Why did you take a vaccine? So this is your outcome. Yes. And there are some who say, why are you doing this? You are making vaccines look bad and you should be quite. So every kind of pressure and imagine these folks, they have to go through this pressure right. and still find a solution for themselves. And Sean, I really appreciate you that you are going through the pressure, this grinder, finding solution for yourself mm -hmm. and then have the grace to then show, share it with others as well. You become a leader for the others, not the leader in a negative way, but leader to say to others that here is solutions. Let's look at them. Can I show to the team here, to Cool Beans, you have done some surveys as well. What yeah. are these surveys about? So we have done two as... Uh... Let me just say, so React 19 is the organization that was formed to fill the void. And it is an organization that is is for what exactly what you said, all of us that are caught in this in the crosshairs. And what we wanted to do was have a organization that was razor focused on the science and razor focused on getting awareness and help to the injured without all the noise about anti-vax, anti-mandate, you know, we're, you know, we, we don't get, get involved in that. We're just about the science, how to get everyone help and share what we learn uh, from the community. So as part of that, a lot of work, and I should say everybody in there is injured mostly and all volunteer, no salary. So people work when they can, they contribute what they can when they're feeling well, uh, and sometimes even when they're not feeling well. So here what you see is a, we, we created a place where we can house all of the case reports and uh, journal articles and anything that is published related to uh, the vaccine so everyone can easily find it, uh, medical professionals or patients. So we to date gathered over 1,250 uh, case reports and journal articles. And they're all categorized um, by either s side effect or uh, general information about the vaccine. And uh, while you are having us navigate through this, can I ask you a quick question about what Skyfrog asked? I know I will forget or his question would scroll up. It's slightly not relevant to this uh, page, but relevant to your condition. Uh, Skyfrog says, I did not hear how long from his initial shot to the weakness in the right arm. So my right arm was uh, affected very early on from the first dose. But the, the, per, the easy fatigue, it's really became pronounced, I would say, towards... August, September of 2021, and then uh, even more pronounced uh, these past few months. Got it. Thank you very much. So, Skyfrog, hopefully that is the answer. So, back here to this uh, survey here, Sean, mm -hmm. please tell us a little more. Yeah. So, if you, if you scroll down, you can see uh, all the articles and how they're all uh, categorized. Um, by topic. So you can find if there was anything about transverse myelitis that was published, you can find it about GBS, the different cases. I mean, it's all everything that was reported is these are Thanks. all articles that are uh, published or in preprint. And these seem to be all legitimate, at least servers seem to be legitimate. These are not some somebody's no. blog or, or no B. it's all they're all scientific articles yes this is excellent thank you very much for putting this together and i also have your uh, powerpoint would you like to go over that now or should i 
Sure, um, we can say, or here I was just going to point out this here is a diagnostic workup that a group of people have worked on. This is to help the injured guide their way and navigate what testing should be done. So we know to date we haven't seen uh, a lot of patterns to say what's really going on, but we have, uh, we, we do know some of the things that people should get tested for, right? And, and roll out based on the community. So here you can see kind of like all the labs that, uh, that uh, the injured have been getting, and they're also categorized. And then there's a little brief explanation there as to like why or a notation that's important uh, for the injured, why they might want to look at this or want, or why they wouldn't want to look at it. This is excellent. Uh -huh. And for the Cool Beans listening, the links to these pages are in the description of this video. Sorry, back to you, Sean. Yeah, so so that's why we, if you click, go all the way down, I think where you can click on uh, the, you can actually click and print a PDF uh go up a little bit there dive there click on that and there you will see we kind of came up with like the top six most uh common uh diagnostics that were positive um on the first page i think it is you scroll up a little bit scroll down there uh, under action plan so this is, a, we also here introduced the document because we obviously don't want some uh, patient printing this and taking it in and saying to, you know, any one doctor, please run all these tests because we know a lot of us are getting gaslit. So we wouldn't want someone that some doctors are like, oh, what is this? You know, I'm not going to run all these hundreds of tests. But so we kind of give a brief introduction there. And then we uh, talk a little bit about the more most common tests that were found. We know a lot of people have positive tilt tests. A lot of people have um, skin biopsies positive for small fiber neuropathy. We know there's been like a lot of elevations in, uh, in specific autoantibodies. There's been specific elevations in cytokines and in inflammation markers. So we kind of direct them where to focus, um, but it's also a, something that should be done with your doctor in relation to your specific symptoms. There's the top six kind of tests that are turning up among us. Um, you'll see like echoes there for a lot of people who have the myocarditis, pericarditis, the elevated histamines for people who have the mast cell activation component, right. and then the inflammation markers for people who have the uh, inflammatory syndromes. Got it. Thank you very much. And I'm going to go over your survey results as well. You do have this, uh, um, this organization is uh, non-profit. Yes, it's registered in Mequon, Wisconsin. And the founders are Dr. Joel Walskog, who and Bri Brianna Dressen, both of whom are, were injured. Yes, and Brianna has been on my um, show as well. And... Uh, so you are doing all, do you actually help patients who are not able to get their um, labs or their management because they are not financially? Um, we do have a care fund where we try to help people in, who have a financial need get access to treatment, pay for labs. Uh, again, we're dependent on donations. Uh, every penny goes of the fund goes to injured. So like I said, everybody is injured and volunteering and it's a small number of people who are trying, struggling to put out uh, all this wonderful stuff that you're looking at here. It takes a lot of work. And um, it does. I run a drbean.com yeah. site as well and I know how much it, right. I have so many engineers and team members to help me with that. Right. And so <laughs> I, I do what I can, but I have, my brain capacity and my physical capacity is nowhere near my ability to to do uh, all of the work that's needed to be done. So it's yeah, but thank it's you. Amazing man. what is being done. Thank you. And Susan says, "What's the site's name? React nineteen dot org." And once again, Susan, I have all of these link in the description of this video. I'm going to put that here, anyways once more 
And my disclaimer, I have no financial, I mean, it would be horrible to have a financial interest with a, with a charitable organization that is trying to help those who are already not getting their insurance monies and those. So I have no such relationship. If at all, I would donate to them instead of any other thing. So just be uh, aware of that. So you, uh, Sean, you have run some surveys. Do you want to help us understand what you have found out? Yeah, so uh, this is a kind of a big uh, announcement here because we have, uh, I think a lot of the injured know we have been posting online a lot of surveys for them to take. And we are gathering uh, all that data and uh, people within React 19 are being, are kind enough to process all of this and put put this into nice graphs. I'm not going to go over all the findings today, but I did want to say, you know, there have, we have, all of this has culminated in some pretty interesting things. We've, there have been, uh, we have done two uh, surveys. Uh, the Germans have also done a survey. And then uh, we've also looked at the Pfizer documents that have been released. And one of the most interesting things we found is that the German surveys and the React 19 surveys are uh, similar in findings and also match what was in the Pfizer documents that were released in terms of findings of different reactions. So I'll just give a brief like highlight of some of the interesting things we found. So um, this was the first survey that was done with 508 participants in the United States. And here you can see um, when people develop symptoms when they began. And you can see on the left here that almost everybody, the bulk is within the first two weeks. Um, if you look at the one week and the 2.5 days and the two to 24 hours, you'll see that the bulk is, is there's a pretty uh, quick onset to when these occur. And that's kind of interesting because a lot of immunologists, uh, especially when you see like within two to 24 hours, a lot of immunologists will dispute and say, well, sometimes it takes, you know, days to get uh, these kind of pronounced reactions. And it's in fact, with some of these vaccines, it's not true. And even in my case, I had uh, tingling and warm and cold sensations up and down my right arm 20 minutes after my injection. So, uh, and then here we see like about this other uh, <clears throat> graph here looks at when do people's symptoms improve? And you can see there's been, some people have a, a significant improvement at three months, but overall, uh, if you look at the last column, a lot of people have not, Im were not improving at the time of this survey. And this survey was done August 21st through October or August, 2021 through October of 2021. Got it. Uh, and this was what one of the more, so we were, what we wanted to find when we were running the survey is what, what is going on with the injured? What's, what are all these symptoms, right? And um, this is predominantly out of um, this group of people that have this myriad of symptoms. It seems to be multi-system, multi-organ, uh, undefined, poorly, you know, poorly defined, uh, and not your typical reactions that you see somebody who has, you know, classic Bell's palsy, they go to the ER, they're, they're diagnosed, they're treated, eventually resolved. But this is this cluster that has this bizarre myriad of symptoms and they show up at their doctor's office with this and then they get labeled anxiety or you know some kind of psychological issue because it's so confounding it's so perplexing to physicians and so we categorized this and we came up with these uh symptom clusters as you can see here uh common diagnoses that were found and then the common symptoms uh, that our people are experiencing. And you can see it's very broad, right? Like we have tinnitus, we have twitching, we have tachycardia, people have uh, rashes, uh, burning, food sensitivities. It's, it's quite diverse uh, in terms of what's going on. And you can, I could, when I saw this, I was like, there I am, I could see myself, right? 
And uh, we call it a syndrome because, it, you know, as syndromes, it's they often have diverse symptoms, but no clear diagnosis. Right. So it yeah. looks like everything. But yeah. in, and so that was interesting to, to, to uncover this. Interesting. And here you can see top reported symptoms. This was the survey out of over 1,000 people from around the world. We, we found, again, uh, a multitude of symptoms uh, in, in each individual. But you see here fatigue, uh, exercise intolerance, like post-exertional malaise. Uh, tinnitus was was a big one. Muscle twitching is a very common one among the injured. The paresthesias, brain fog, dizziness, palpitations. So, got it. So, <clears throat> there were studies coming out of UK which showed similar results as well. So, thank you very much for doing these. I cannot since you've been showing us this. What is going through my head is. This should have been healthcare authorities doing it. And here we have vaccine injured people for their own sake and others. They are pulling all of this together and presenting and making sense of it and then coming and sharing it. This is just so. Yeah, it's a handful of sick individuals with, you yeah, know, using them, pulling their brain power together to try to make sense of it. Yeah. But you're right, it's a failure. And I say this all the time. And one of the reasons why I step up is that if, you, if you're rolling out an emergency youth author, use authorization right, product, you're, you're, the government should have an obligation to have a system in place to investigate aggressively any uh, event that occurs uh, from these vaccines. And, in, and I, it shouldn't be left to a passive self-reporting system like theirs, right? It's not enough. And I never realized that pharmacovigilance in, in the United States was as weak as it is, right? And I will say again today, I'm almost 19 months into this struggle. And I don't and I don't, I know that no one has logged me into VAERS, except for myself. They're all my own reports. Yeah, this is. <clears throat> it's, it's incomprehensible to me as a health professional. I can't believe what yeah. I'm living through. And I always tell people the me today, you know, if I, the person I was two years ago would not believe the the person I am today if we met and I tried to explain what's happening to me. And that's how I feel when I talk to other people who aren't, who aren't injured. It's like I'm instantly on another planet and everything I'm saying is in another language. Like people just cannot comprehend what has happened to me. Even doctors cannot. Doctors cannot actually, they simply say, so one, uh, I was at the FLCCC conference and they were saying over there, the doctors were talking and they were saying, we guide doctors and patients that as soon as something comes up which says, I don't know what is going on, suspect long COVID or vaccine injury and see if there is, a, there is an answer somewhere over there. This is just not... Uh, you were saying that there are some studies that are starting about the IVIG and others, but they do not include vaccine injury. They have long COVID studies. Was that correct? Uh, did I get it correctly? Long, long COVID. Yeah, I think that. Well, we know that the bulk of the research now is focused on long COVID, right? And that that battle was one in itself, right? Like people with long COVID were also dismissed for a long period of time. But yeah, there are studies coming coming up, and all the bulk of the funding is going for long COVID, and anybody who's vaccine vaccine injured is really uh, excluded. Yeah. From the research, which is also boggles my mind, right? Because I think, don't yeah. you want, I always think, don't you want to know? Because don't you want a safer product, right? You want to always ensure. And I want to comment on this one. John made this comment. Yes, much more attention is on long COVID. Here is the reason, John, in my opinion. The reason is 
long covid can be used to say you want to not have long covid go get a vaccine <laughs> but vaccine injury cannot be used to say go get a vaccine that is why long covid is acceptable but vaccine injury is not that's my opinion maybe things are different or they do not actually believe there as there are vaccine injuries which also would not surprise me so uh, i mean we the- also have to we also have to look back at history too right other vaccines were pulled from the market for far less right for just a few cases of gbs or a few cases of narcolepsy and they were withdrawn um, but here it seems like there's just a total blind eye and the public health policy isn't keeping pace with the science, right? And it seems that the more the science is evolving, the more entrenched public health policy is getting. It's not pivoting and adapting yeah, so uh, to follow the science. Policy is selective for science. What science? So if you think about it this way, Imagine I am healthcare administrator and all my head is stuck on is I want everyone to be vaccinated. Then I would, of course, push any narrative. And again, people, this is not me. I'm, I'm playing the role of a public health, the current ones. So I would push every narrative that can bring people to the vaccine. But if there is anything that is going to make them hesitate, or think that is hidden. This is what's happening. Right. I mean, I'm not naive either, right? I know there is, you know, there's a there is a very strong anti-vaccine movement and that does jeopardize the, you know, the good aspects of vaccination and protection of public health. And to, we don't want to further create hesitancy. Right. And, but there and that, must be a middle ground where you also you you want to protect people who are in, injured from things. Right. You don't it can't be an all or nothing. Right. You can't just have human casualties. There has to be some obligation and some system in place to protect absolutely. us. That's just ethics. It is. And honestly, if, for example, today I am not, if I'm not vaccinated and somebody says, go get a vaccine and I see a vaccine injured and I see that they are just thrown on the side of the road and not even cared for, I'll be very, very careful to say, sure, it will be a rare situation. But if I am the one who would get it, I will be for the rest of my life, just be thrown on the side of the road then. So I may be better off without it. On the other hand, if there is a proper structure available where I can say, you know what, even if something happens to me, there's going to be financial support for my injuries. I'm going to be able to go and get the the medicines, the labs, and they, they know what is going on, what are possible, how are they going to treat us. Doctors know it. Labs know it. Insurance know it. Healthcare authorities know it. They're on top of it. It would reduce my anxiety and it would actually convince me more to take that risk and they are just turning a blind eye so back here the it says on the top here symptoms is that the covid symptoms or is that the symptoms of the vaccine injury or is are these the symptoms of long COVID? what did what are these, these are the symptoms of the vaccine injury among the 1041 who were reported and this is just to show it's a very busy graph but what is to show is that we don't just show up with one symptom, right? We have a, we have a lot of symptoms, uh, you know, all, all, Fatigue, all going on off. at the same time. Numbness, yeah. dizziness, sleep disturbance, joint pain, high heart rate, nerve pain, muscle twitching, and it just keeps going. Yes, it's but, it's a, it's debilitating illness, right? It's uh, yeah. it's not just one th- it's not just one symptom. It's not just one system that's yep. being impacted. And uh, this is showing out time and time again among uh, both of our surveys and the German survey. Fatigue, exercise, intolerance, brain. These have been actually, without fail, the top issues that I see everywhere. Yes, Even and the irony is that it, it also mimics long COVID symptoms in yeah. many cases, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it, even with the long, because I think the common grounds between them is the spike protein. 
mm-hmm. because spike protein is the contributing factor towards long COVID as well. And here is a spike protein too. So the immune system's responses are similar because we are giving the same antigen. Right. I think the next slide shows... Uh... Yeah, so we asked what was the most uh, debilitating symptom and which one most people would want to eliminate as the single symptom that was problematic. And you can see here was the painful neuropathy, which I can attest to personally. This is it, this is so incomprehensible to people. I think only people who have nerve pain syndromes can really understand what this does to you. It's like a constant torture. Yes. Right. You and are, I can, I you can have tell, no control over. Yes. I can tell it because of a different thing. I had thrown my back and popped my disc, which caused uh, my nerves in the legs to start having paresthesias. And man, I could not even walk when I had that until they surgically corrected it. I could not walk. I would wish if my leg can just be cut off and to get me rid of this pain. And so I can imagine if the whole body is in that state, how um, right. how uh, debilitating that would be. I mean, you have moments that are, for some, it's a constant. Some have waxing and waning. Some, a lot of us have worse at night when we lay down. Of course, you're more you're more aware of your your body and what's going on at nighttime. But it's like trying to sleep and you're being stung by yeah. bees. Yeah. Or your feet are vibrating. This shows you how, because of the the multitude of symptoms, it shows you the impact on us, right? 30% said they were unable to work. 54% were unable to exercise and 9% were bed bound. Mm. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not something to be taken lightly by, by doctors. This is uh, what is going on is debilitating to us. And this, doesn't even include the mental health co- co- component. Correct. And this should be all in red instead of green. So, yeah. And then I was just, oh, I wanted to show on that, if you could go back to that previous slide, if people, even if people don't, you know, we would we would love for people to donate so that you, we, you could support our work. And if you can't donate money, you can also become... Uh, a member, a supporting member at Amazon and go to smile.amazon.com and you can register React 19 and that's React space 19 and you'll find it in Mequon, Wisconsin. And if you add that, every purchase, they donate a percentage to our organization every time you order. So that would also be one way for people to help support uh, our science. I'm going to share that this link is not in the description. You can find this link from the website, but I just placed that in the um, in the comments as well. Once again, for anyone who's here, I have no financial interest. My interest is Sean, people like Sean, figuring out how to bring them back home, if you will. And so, uh, Sean, thank you very much for what you are doing and your team is doing. This is what I love about uh, U.S. and these... Uh, modern, uh, sophisticated uh, societies, that people come together. They start solving issues. They start working together to start finding help while the others, the health, healthcare authorities or others are dragging their foot. So thank you very much, feet. So thank you very much for your work. No, thank you for following and letting me share my struggle. Absolutely. With uh, everyone. I mean, like I said, we've been in this from the beginning right we connected and uh you've been an invaluable resource for all of us because you also stick to the science and you tell the science and that uh, a lot of us find you know are educated through you so your service is just as invaluable thank you very much i am humbled for this i wish nobody had this outcome and if they do they just very quickly become uh, cured and healed and fully back to normal. Uh, a few questions, if I can take. Susan says, how long does spike protein float around? That's a good question. 
It's a good question. We really do not have good answers to this. No. I mean, yes. they say they can detect it, right? In some cases, up to 15 months now. Um, yeah. But yeah, so the S1 part of the spike protein yeah. hanging out in the monocytes is observed to be for four, 15 months as well. That is Patterson and Dr. Yo's mm -hmm. research. Um, but the spike protein, the whole spike protein itself circulating somewhere, right. Uh, there are studies that I had shared a few days ago as well. There is a study from Stan, uh, actually from Yale, which interestingly, when I shared that study on Twitter, it's a study from Yale. And I shared it on Twitter and they marked it as disinformation and blocked my account for what, whatever number of hours I don't give them. They, they're just weird. So in that study, they had said that the spike protein after a vaccination, vaccination continues to be produced in the uh, local lymph nodes for a couple of months. And that is understandable. The mRNA would go there, macrophages would take it there, and the, the cells would continue to produce it. And they said that spike protein-related antibodies and the spike protein stayed in the blood as well for a few weeks to months. And in some patients, the amount of spike protein generated by the vaccine was very similar to amount of spike protein generated by the patient of the COVID. And uh, I have that study on my site as well. It's a good study from Yale, accepted, published study. And uh, Twitter-like folks actually blocked it. Uh, so here is a question from Texas Mike. How much could the symptoms be treated as dysautonomia, IV hydration, compression, leggings, physical therapy, some meds? I think the, in my case, I did do a lot of those interventions for to control the dysautonomia, I just think in for some reason, in in our circumstance, it's sometimes so so pronounced and so severe that these interventions don't don't work. Like even when I was using compression and uh, stay hydrated, and I was on a beta blocker, I still had breakthrough positional tachycardia sometimes going up you know, where it would spiral out of control and become uh, SVT, non-sustained ventricular mm -hmm. tachycardia, and I'd end up in the emergency room. Wow. M. Gregory says, are these symptoms a result of hyperinflammation? I think we're so, looking at all kinds of avenues, right? Okay. It could be inflammation, auto, autoimmune, disimmune. Yeah. So at the end of the day, at in the under the core of all of this, you can call it inflammation because wherever the antibodies are, there would be inflammation. Mm -hmm. Wherever T cells are, there is going to be inflammation. Wherever this complement is, there is mm -hmm. going to be inflammation. Our body's response to everything offending is inflammation. So you can say that the inflammation is a final common pathway for any problem. Right. However, what caused the inflammation? Is this autoantibodies or are these angry mast cells or are these B cells sitting in the bone marrow or T cells sitting somewhere or are these macrophages that have gone mad or crazy? Those phenotypes of what is the etiology, what are the triggers causing the inflammation are different in so many people. There's a question uh, from Susan. Have you had COVID? No. Okay. And I've been tested many times, uh, antibody tested and PCR tested. So. Got it. Uh, Margaret McKinney says, uh, thank you, Dr. Mubin and Cool Beans. And thank you. She had, I think, posted before. Thank you to you as well. Um, there is a question from Sir Paul Modib. That is, are they still targeting alpha strain? So are you talking about the vaccine's target? Uh, original Wuhan strain? I think so. Uh, so I think your question was in two parts. Are, are all three vaccines out of date? So Moderna's vaccine has been continuing to update it, to be updated. However, the, their Omicron vaccine, they had said, will be released in August. They had been creating a mixture of new mRNA and previous mRNA. 
So with this, let me see if there is any other question. Um, there is one more question. Let's see. Robin says, have you done any extended fasting? Not yet. M, M. Gregory says, Dr. Bean has the best guests and the smartest guests. So you are best and smart. We are with you. I'll yeah. take it. I feel like cognitively <laughs> destroyed, but I take the compliment. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand the brain fog and the... Uh, there is one more question and then we stop. So Gibble says, with Maravirak being effective, why haven't you tried it? Uh, I don't know. It's on my list of things. I think I, I try to do things that I think are within the reason at the moment for what is going on. And, uh, you know, I, I try to do things methodically. Uh, so, one by one. and, and increment, yeah. in one by one to see what's the response. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. Got it. Nipa Gandhi, and Nipa is a doctor as well. She's saying, what about trying gut microbiome mm -hmm. therapy? So I do uh, work on restoring, or not, I don't know if mine, I haven't tested mine, but so I don't know if it's impaired, but I do work on uh, supporting my gut microbiome. So I do. Uh... Yeah, uh, Sean, we cannot hear you. Probably your headphones ran out of battery. Not yet. You can probably just have uh, without the headphones directly in the mic. Meanwhile, I will not yet. We cannot hear you yet. So I'm going to... Hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes. So you were saying... Uh, we were talking about what? We were talking about the... The microbiome. Yes. So I take uh, a probiotic and I also take uh, sodium butyrate to help with restore the lining of the gut. Got it. Uh, there's a question from Michael. God bless you both. Are the symptoms matching COVID long effects, long COVID? If not, why is it different? I think they are the same or very similar. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mimicry. Yeah, there is a lot of overlap between them. Um Andre says, Dr. Bean, how did you resolve your heart palpitations after COVID? Um, I didn't do anything special. They are gone at this time. Although last night when I was sleeping, I felt I had some very faint feeling of palpitation. But then I thought that was just me maybe psychologically focused on it. But I do not have it the way these were when I could not even sleep. And I would have to turn on rain sounds or some sounds just to distract myself. Sean, that's what happened to me a few weeks ago. That was, I mean, sitting in front of you and complaining doesn't look right. Uh, you are going through so much. Yeah, the uh, heart stuff is extreme scary. That had really thrown me mentally because that is so, my episodes come out of the blue. Yeah. Like I can just be standing, doing like washing my hands and boom. It's scary. It's, it's scary. And think about it that we, I, my palpitations only. Vaccine injured or long COVID, long COVID are still getting some help. Vaccine injured just counts, not even counts. Hmm. I mean, not even counted correctly. Anyways, so Lida Lada says, Sean, have you tried self hypnosis for sleep and tinnitus? God bless. Yes, I have. <laughs> And I'm still exploring uh, professional hypnosis for to help with that because it's one of the it's one of the more chronic debilitating symptoms that affect everything. My focus, 
everything keeps watching TV. Even tonight after using the headphones, I will be ringing like crazy going so to bed. So sorry. <clears throat> uh, one more question. Your next option 21 says, have you talked to Dr. Jar Jordan Vaughn? He's been working with long COVID with vaccine injured. No. Um, Susan says, have you asked your doctor for a heart monitor? Holter or? I've been, I have one implanted in my chest now. Oh, wow. So I, w I used to wear the one, uh, for, I had several over the time frames, and they have captured everything from uh, PVCs to atrial fibrillation to SVT. So they Missy decided to put one inside my, I, so I have a, it's supposed to stay there for up to three years. Wow. I'm so sorry, Sean, that you're going through this. Um, Missy says, would you expect to have similar symptoms if infected with COVID? I fear my vax reaction would happen all over again. So Missy, it is not known that if you are vaccinated and uh, had the vaccine injury, the same will become exaggerated with the virus. Although I would suspect from a mechanistic point of view that the spike would bother the persons, but it is, I haven't yet seen any such combination. Sean, do you have any um, data or have you seen this? No, the only data we know is, so one, one is I always wonder what would be, what would have happened to me if I had gotten COVID, right? Would I have had the same, uh, or s would I would have, would I have had a severe COVID if I hadn't gotten the vaccine, you know, because of the vaccine reaction, is there some parallel to be drawn there? I don't think we know enough, but we do, what we do know is people who are injured by the vaccine, when they do get COVID, they do have a f often a flare of symptoms, a worsening of their symptoms. Uh, sometimes it returns to baseline, but it can take a while mm -hmm. for, for people to settle down after they've had COVID. And next week, I'll have Michelle Zimmerman come back. She has the vaccine injury, but she got and she got the COVID as well. So I'll request her to give us more of how she felt. Uh, Michael says, I had atrial fib and tachycardia. Not sure if related, but daily ice cold shower really reduced my symptoms and other inflammatory issues. So one last question, Sean. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rene says, so if you feel you are being better cared for because of your medical background or just your determination regarding receiving help in the treatment? I would say it's the determination, right? And this is why I always say to all the other injured, because I know personally how much they suffer, like don't give up and don't give in. I say that to everyone. We can't give up. We can't give in. We have to keep going. Yeah. And this actually brings me to this point that if you can help in any ways, financial help is the best way to contribute to others' help. And if you need help, then uh, reach out to React as well. There are many other organizations too. Uh, maybe I can help in some ways too. But this is the best way for us to continue to move forward. Sean, with this, Thank you so much. Any closing notes before we break for tonight? I, I I would just echo what you said. You know, we we need we need help. We need financial help. We need support to be able to put this stuff together. Uh, we people who are doing this are sick and injured, and they're all volunteering when they feel well. Um, you can contribute. Uh, money towards helping others get access to medical care. You can contribute as a volunteer if you have research and science background and you can, you're can. you willing to spend time helping us. That would be great. We're also looking to put together an actual research study where we collect blood and specimens to help analyze and determine some underlying pathologies. So we'll be looking for people to donate for that study. Uh, and it would be the first study of its kind for, for the injured community. So we're 
uh, working on so many fronts, but we're not fully powered by people, right? We're just, like I said, a cluster of some injured people. And uh, ha most of us are, are on well. Myself, I've been on well, so I haven't been able to to do as much as, as I would like to do um, to support other people. Um, but yeah, if anybody out there can help us, we, we need you. One more question. Uh, John says, are any senators advocating for, for funding? Not that we know of, no. We are working. We have some people that are working with the politicians to try to get them to be to bring awareness uh, of this and also to help with the vaccine injury, the compensation program that isn't working. So it's another battle, right? We're so many battles to be fought within this war. It's a complete um, wing of medicine that a healthcare authority or department should have put together. They yeah. should have gone to the vaccine companies and said, we gave you billions of dollars. Yes, Out of that, here is a fund you need to make and you need to do the research and compile the papers and the scientific papers and the patients and, and work with the insurance companies and work with the patient. This needs to be pulled together at a national level with those level of resources. I am just so, I'm going to start <laughs> coming upset again. So Sean, thank you very much for your time. I'm so sorry that you're going through this, but I'm so proud of you that regardless of all of that, you are not only helping yourself, you're helping in that process, the whole injury, uh, commu injured community. Uh, bless you for that and mm -hmm. stay safe and happy and healthy. I wish you recover fully and soon. Thank you. I just think we need to turn something, make something good out of something bad. So with this, Cool Beans, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to take another off tomorrow, and we will come back on Monday. So in the meantime, if I can request you, if you can do a tiny bit of a help, and that is share this video with someone. Maybe share with them that, hey, look at the areas where they can help come in and donate. Or if they are injured, then ask them to see and uh, listen to various videos by Sean. Please do us that favor and share it. And I would see you on Monday. Thank you. Bye-bye.